God's grace, mercy, and peace in Christ Jesus be with each of you this day and always. Amen. I've missed you in worship. Don't worry, your elder's not going to give you that where have you been phone call. Uh, You know, normally when I look out and see folks missing on Sunday mornings, I pretty much have no idea where they are. But on Palm Sunday, our sanctuary sits empty, and I do know where most of you are. You're at home and not by choice. Fortunately, even when we can't come to God, God still comes to us. Where? In His Word, in your Bible, and in this Word of God that's preached to you. So, as God welcomes us into His house to hear the Word, let's welcome God into our houses to hear His Word. So, let us pray. Father, welcome into our homes and into our hearts. We thank you for the gift of your word through which your Holy Spirit speaks to us, words that create and strengthen our faith. Bless us again as we listen to your word this day, that you would strengthen our hearts in true faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from the Old Testament, Zechariah 9, verse 9. It's the prediction of Palm Sunday. The Holy Spirit writes, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Palm Sunday Gospel is taken from the Gospel of Matthew in the 21st chapter, beginning in verse 1. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. And all of this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set Jesus on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed after cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And so the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. You know, it's a really strange preaching to an empty sanctuary. Uh, usually I can look out and see who is dozing off, uh, who's looking at their watch, who has a scowl on their face like I just insulted their mother. But today I can't see you, so doze away. Special shout out to my favorite pew, Brenda Thompson, June Strausser, Sandra Linder, and Martha Tegler. Ladies, I'm saving some Tootsie Roll Pops for you when you return. My sermon is titled, What a Parade. What a Parade. Parades are generally a time of celebration. Cities like Baltimore have parades when the Ravens win the Super Bowl. What? You thought just because I'm recording with no one here that you would be spared a Ravens reference? (laughs) You underestimate my Ravenness, I do believe. New Year's, of course, has been famous as a day of parades. That first Holy Week, there were actually two parades. The first one was the Palm Sunday parade of great joy and exuberance, shouting hosannas, songs were sung, palm branches were waved and thrown into the street. But five days later, all of Jerusalem's attention was on a second parade. The same person was at the center of both processions. The crowds were essentially the same, but it was a parade of a very different sort. 
The joyous cries of Hosanna had turned into shouts of hate. Crucify Him, crucify Him was the song sung that day. And there He was, the very same Christ, bruised, bleeding, bending under the burden of a heavy cross. And instead of jeers, He heard Instead of cheers, he heard jeers. Instead of blowing him kisses, they spit on him. Instead of his disciples, he's surrounded by Roman soldiers with cracking whips and pointed swords. It is not a joyous parade, the second parade of Holy Week. And it's still difficult for us to believe that in five short days, Hosanna's turned in to crucify him. And the cheering crowds turned into a hateful mob. And so we ask, how can this be? You know, it is so hard for us to conceive of such a fast and dramatic change in the people that Holy Week that biblical scholars have long debated if the two parade crowds were the same people. Well, I don't know for certain, but I think we can assume that there were some folks who are a part of both parades. Because these two parades reflect my own hot and cold approach to Jesus. One day I'm filled with the joy of the Lord and thanksgiving to God, and the next day I'm grumbling and pushing Jesus aside so I can do my own thing. My own faith, my own approach to Jesus is reflected in these two parade crowds, and I'm sure yours is too. And I also think some of the reasons are the same as those at the Jesus' parades that Holy Week. First, like those crowds, we turn on Jesus when Jesus does not become the kind of God and the kind of King we want Him to be. The crowds wanted Jesus to set them free from Rome and the oppression in their lives. Later, as Jesus silently accepts His arrest, as Jesus declares His kingdom is not of this world, when the crowds realize Jesus is not going to solve all their problems in life, they turn against Him. And many are like that in the church today. They come to Jesus because they they want someone to straighten out the mess in their life. They want someone to remove the trials and problems they face. And they begin to grumble or turn away from Jesus when their problems continue. And you and I are like that. We sing Hosanna and praise the Lord when Jesus seems to ride in and rescue us from an illness or a difficulty. But our Hosannas turn to complaints when Jesus doesn't seem to solve our problems or to answer our prayers. First, the crowds turned on Jesus when Jesus did not do what they wanted. Second, they turned on Jesus because Jesus did not say what they wanted to hear. And again, that's a reflection of your heart and mine. We cheer Jesus when He condemns those rotten sinners who are out there ruining our society, but we grow silent when Jesus begins to speak about our personal sins. We sing our hosannas when Jesus calls the abortionist or the thief a lost sinner, but we grow silent when Jesus says that we are just as lost and just as sinful as they are. Let's picture for a moment how these two different parades may have come about that first Holy Week. Now, just a few days before Palm Sunday, Jesus had been in a town called Bethany, only a few miles from Jerusalem. And in Bethany, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead after He had been buried for four days. Lazarus rose back to life and was returned to his loved ones and friends, okay? Now, suppose a few days ago reports flooded the media that a man in Raleigh had gone down to the cemetery 
and actually raised a man back to life who had been buried four days earlier. And it's all over the news, and stories of the miracle flood the internet, and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook explode all around the globe. And suppose just like when Jesus raised Lazarus, there were dozens of people who saw it happen, and they're now being interviewed over and over on television. Maybe somebody in Raleigh got a screenshot or a clip of the raising. So literally, it's the only thing anyone has talked about for the last three days. And then suddenly, you and I find out that the very same healer, this man called Jesus, is coming to Winston-Salem on Friday. Fooey on stay-in-place orders, bah humbug on crowd size restrictions. We're all going to rush out on Friday to welcome him. And the roads are jammed, and the streets are filled with the young and the old and the rich and the poor and the healthy, and many suffering, even some from the COVID virus. For if this fellow can raise the dead, certainly he can cure a virus. People from Charlotte and Durham are here, folks from Asheville and Oak Island, all have come to see the miracle man. And as Jesus enters Winston, the streets are lined with mobs of people just trying to get a glimpse of Him. Man, Winston-Salem is throwing a parade. Skies are filled with balloons and fireworks. The National Guard does a flyover. Never has there been such excitement in Winston before, not even when Tim Duncan came to town. And we all want to see some miracles for ourselves. Widows are hoping that Jesus will raise their loved one back to life because He's done it before. Cancer patients push to the front seeking His healing touch. The blind cry out for sight. The roar is deafening as everyone screams at Jesus, both their cheers and their desires. And I'm on the sidewalk, and I've brought my best friend Mickey, who's got terminal prostate cancer. And I'm screaming, and I'm yelling at Jesus, hey, you can raise the dead. I believe. Heal my best friend. Surely, Jesus, surely you can help him. If you are who you say you are, heal my friend. But I can hardly hear myself because of the roar of the frenzied crowd. But then suddenly and instantly, the whole crowd goes silent. I've stopped shouting myself, because a large group of Winston-Salem's finest have surrounded Jesus, and they're handcuffing Him and leading Him away. And the disappointment is literally crushing. The hopes of the crowd burst like a balloon, and we all stand there stunned. And in silence or quiet murmuring, we slowly walk away. And we drive back home, puzzled, puzzled at the lack of power and the weakness that our miracle worker displayed. So, for the next two or three days, the news reports are filled with His trial, not just court TV, but all the channels. This Jesus is on trial for being a fraud, a phony, and a fake. And our own hearts begin to scream at us, we knew it, we knew it, we knew it was fake news. We knew it was too good to be true. And so the anger builds within us. How did we let ourselves get taken in like that? How, how did I let that phony make me think he could do anything for my dying friend? Everyone's hopes are crushed, and our joy has very quickly turned to anger at the deception, anger at the betrayal. He said He was the Son of God. All of us, the cancer patients, the widows, the COVID infected, we had all gotten our hopes up. How could He do that to us? So, our only satisfaction now is to see that this Jesus gets what He deserves. Quiet. The judge is ready to announce His verdict. What is that? The judge said, I find no fault in this man. He has done nothing wrong. I leap up from my sofa. What? Done nothing wrong? What about his deception? What about the fraud? What about all my hopes? And my anger grows, and my neighbor's anger grows, and quickly our hearts are becoming the second crowd at the second parade. Suddenly, they interrupt the news with a special report, 
as this Jesus fellow was being set free, he was carried off by an angry crowd yelling, give him the chair, fry him, crucify him. It's a live report, and in our anger, we find ourselves rooting for the crowd. After all, he deserves it. All the people he deceived, give it to him, give it to him, give it to that fraud. And they did give it to him. And so, so did we, because it is our sin, it is our fickle heart that killed Jesus. We swallow our hosannas whenever Jesus does not do for us what we want. Or we, we join the crowd that killed Him whenever Jesus says what we don't want to hear. But the good news, the good news is this. Jesus looked at that second crowd at the end of that second parade, and in that crowd Jesus saw you and me. And he said to his father, Father, forgive them. For the good news is, no matter how many times our hearts or our lives join the second parade, no matter how often our hearts turn in fickleness from Jesus, Jesus is always faithful. And Jesus never turns on us. Jesus forgives us and Jesus loves us. And Jesus wants to see you and me in a third parade, the parade into heaven, the parade that surrounds His throne in glory, singing hosannas to Jesus forever. Jesus wants to be certain that we join the third parade, and so Jesus continually rides into our hearts and lives through His Word with His complete and total forgiveness for us. That will be the greatest parade of all when you and I are marching around the heavenly throne singing our hosannas not just on Palm Sunday, but for all eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You that though our hearts are often fickle, You are faithful. And most of all, we thank You that You are faithful to forgive, to forgive us our sins in Christ Jesus. We thank You for the message of Holy Week, that the King came humble, riding on an ass, allowed Himself to be humiliated and even put to death because He loves us and He returns us to Your love forever. Lord, bless all who have heard these words today with true saving and strengthening faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And a shout out to my friend Don Davison for being here, the only one here this uh, this morning (laughs) to uh, record the message for us. So thank you, Don. Appreciate that. The Lord bless and be with you all. Amen.